this is uh, our ongoing series, What's New in Preventive Medicine. I've got some nice uh, new, an interesting topic tonight. We're going to talk about healing your gut and the connection between really what we call the brain-gut connection, the mind-brain-gut connection. So that is, uh, is our talk today, and we're going to you know, learn about how problems in the gut can affect the brain, how problems in the brain, we all kind of know how problems in the brain can affect the gut, right? Um, so we're going to talk about the, uh, the old man, we're going to talk about, because it's, the talk's what's new, so we're going to review briefly what's old, what's the kind of t uh, traditional way that we approach these problems. And what it was is really diagnosis driven. So we've talked in the past about how we collect a series of symptoms and we kind of cluster them in so we can come up with a diagnosis, a name, and then we end up treating the condition. So this is really sort of the old chop the body into lots of different pieces, go deeper and deeper in so we have you know surgeons that do just hands or just knees or just lung doctors or just gut doctors or just you know it, it, it kind of goes further and further in and nobody's really paying attention to the big picture so that's part of the problem. So this led to the one disease one drug model which is basically if you name it you can tame it. So we get a name for it, we call it diabetes, we call it migraine, we call it uh, fibromyalgia and then we say, oh, here's the treatment for migraine, here's the treatments for fibromyalgia, and we start treating everybody the same because they share a similar diagnosis. The problem is we end up treating the condition and not the person. And medicine has advanced, especially what we call functional medicine, and some of the very sophisticated testing we can do now to the point that we can really identify what's unique about you. So we don't just treat we don't just call it migraine anymore because the, 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 what happened is we realized 100 patients with migraines have 100 different diseases. The, the story behind the disease, the unique biochemical, what we call biochemical individuality of every person dramatically influences how that disease acts in any given person. So you see the the name it the one disease one drug or treating a diagnosis or a condition it would work if these conditions existed on their own but they don't they exist in you and me and we're all unique and we're all individuals so that's the problem so here's a nice idea of the old subspecialty in our cartoon Dr. Winslow's uh, uh, the 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 coordinator's talking to the patient he says Dr. Winslow will be checking your heart Dr. Briggs will be checking your lungs, and I will be checking your bank account. So there's somebody for every uh, specialty. No, it, it's not funny about the bank account. You know, I have a patient who developed an infection in her gut. She needs a, a special medicine called vancomycin. I called to find out it's one tablet three times a day for 10 days. It's $60 a pill. Yes, it's eighteen hundred dollars for the so anyway, um, what's the new medical paradigm? So what it's prevention driven and it's I borrow this phrase from Mark Hyman, who's kind of the spokesman for functional medicine, and we treat causes, not conditions. So we're not so worried about naming things because naming things, although, it had its place, it doesn't give us the full story. So we really look at what are the underlying causes. This is what we call functional medicine. It's how all these systems in the body function as a whole. The digestive system, the neurological system, the emotional brain, the, the, um, the motor system, all these, uh, the, the nutritional system. So it's based on systems biology and we don't treat the symptoms but rather we treat the whole person and the cause. The treatment is accurately aimed at the underlying causes of those imbalances. So what we say is depression is not a Prozac deficiency. Prozac works for some people with depression, but it's not, it, what we need to do is say, well, why does this person have low serotonin? 
Whereas if you just name it depression, you put everybody on the same medicines, and it could it could go for any um, any diagnosis from autism to diabetes to depression to bipolar to you name it. And then of course uh, the reason prevention is so important from our uh, daily wisdom guru here is that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of insurance forms. So it's very important to prevent anything. That alone can drive you crazy. Now, I'm going to give you an example of why things aren't always as simple as they seem. And this, this cartoon illustrates it beautifully. The doctor's looking at the patient with an arrow through his head, says, offhand, I'd say you're suffering from an arrow through your head. But just to play it safe, I'm ordering a bunch of tests, right? So let me give you an example from 2008, New England Journal of Medicine. I've gone over this with you before, but it's, it's worth repeating. 10,000 patients with type 2 diabetes were designed, half the group received either intensive therapy or regular therapy to lower the blood sugar. After about three and a half years, the study was stopped because the patients who were having their blood sugar aggressively lowered and were getting better results in lowering their blood sugar had more deaths and more heart attacks. So you see that simple arrow in the head can be deceiving. You think, oh, well, look, lower the sugar more, we're going to get better results, right? Why didn't it work? Because elevated blood sugar is just a symptom of diabetes. The underlying mechanism is insulin resistance. And then you need to look at what's causing the insulin resistance. So really what happened is the drugs used to treat aggressively the symptom were actually causing more problems in the body. There was more toxicity to the body from the drugs. And we, you know, you're going to see in the next 10 years, there's going to be pretty much revolution in a number of things. Some things like we'll talk about later, like Prevacid and Prilosec and all these antacid type drugs, because they have, they do take the symptoms away, but they have significant problems on the other end. Same with Lipitor. I've talked about this before. Lipitor lowers blood cholesterol. It reduces your risk of heart attack. Uh, especially if you've had a first heart attack, it reduces the risk of a second, but it increases your risk of dying from other things. So we end up where cardiologists have a sort of narrow reductionist view of the world, a sort of skewed view, because that's all they see. And what do they want to do? Their concern is make sure you don't have another heart attack, right? The fact that you may end up with a greater risk of having cancer or some other disorder doesn't, it's not their turf, right? So in a sense, it's like, that's not my area. I don't worry about that. And that's one of the reasons that functional medicine and prevention is so important because what Dr. Hyman says is the, the next, the, the, next uh, the doctor of the future is, a, is going to be a super generalist, not a super specialist. Somebody like me and other people who focus on the whole person and all these systems and how they interplay together. Alice, did you want to ask a question? Uh-huh. Control. So there, isn't that interesting? Yeah, even more uh, complications on the, 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 the retinal problems. Okay, so foundationally, these are the principles of functional medicine. This is my professor who I'm studying with and getting certified with, Dr. Gant, and his famous phrase is, if you don't test, you've guessed. We, we sometimes have to guess a little because not everybody can afford to do every test we want to do, but if we can, it's better to test because then we know exactly what happens in you. Uh, so that's one of the fundamental principles. We, we measure everything that we can. The second is what Hyman calls the 10 tack theory. It simply means, and what one of his mentors taught him was, if you have a patient and they step on uh, seven tacks or 10 tacks, you don't remove three or four of them and say take some aspirin to get rid of the pain on the rest, right? You just methodically remove one after another. And that's what we'll show you we do on these systems in functional medicine. We methodically go through the different systems and we remove that tack. And it's a reason why sometimes, you know, we have a treatment that we know lowers inflammation, 
but it doesn't reduce heart attacks. We have to look at the other system. Could there be another problem? Is there another tack on the foot, right? And part of the way we do it is by measuring what we call functional markers. And I'll show you how this is done. One of the tests that we do on all our patients here is a homocysteine level. The reason we check homocysteine is because this is a marker for B vitamin status. In other words, if I would measure B vitamins in um, many of you, the blood would show that they're normal. Hey, you have a normal B12 level, normal B6 level. But more important than measuring the blood level of a vitamin or a nutrient is how does that nutrient function in the body. So what we find is we need, let's take B12 for instance, we need B12 to help convert homocysteine into something called SAMe which is a, a natural brain chemical that is a natural antidepressant. You can actually buy SAMe at Costco. But SAMe is part of a process that then goes back to methionine, back to homocysteine. But it's a very important process in the body called methyl, a methylator, methylation. So even though your B12 level may be normal, if your homocysteine level is high, you need more B12. I know because if you had B12, your, your homocysteine would be being converted into SAMe. Does that make sense? So we now measure functional markers for disease. We, we find out it's much more accurate than just measuring a blood level, which varies if, you know, what, you can just think of this. If you drank a bunch of orange juice the night before and we measured your vitamin C level the next day, probably be pretty good. But is there enough vitamin C to drive different reactions in the body? or B in this case. So anyway, that's kind of how we do it. The other, this is just my personal um, uh, philosophy in medicine, and I love this saying from the Zohar, the Jewish mystical um, works, is that God sends the cure before he sends the malady. And I found this uh, great cartoon. This is Goliath has been struck by David's uh, um, slingshot, is that what it is? And uh, he just manages to lift up his head and said, David, I want you tested for steroids, right? It's very important. Uh... All right, so what are those systems? What are the tacks that get under our feet and cause illness? I came up with this mnemonic called the seven hidden, and the H goes here, the I goes here, the D here. So what they are in brief is hormone imbalance, which was our first talk, inflammation, which we did last month, Today we're doing digestive disorders, detoxification, energy problems with the mitochondria, which are the little um, batteries or energy factories in every cell, and nutritional deficiencies and neurotransmitter deficiencies, serotonin, dopamine, vitamins, minerals, we can measure all those. And then finally, stress, mental, emotional, or spiritual stress, and all these really cause stress on the system. This is sort of the physical stress, and then mental, emotional, spiritual stress goes down here. And these two administrators uh, tested all their new students, and the school test results show that they all tested positive for stress. No big surprise. Um, so dealing with digestion. The guts, if you remember nothing more than this, it'll explain a lot about what you're about to hear. The gut is intelligent and mischievous. It's a wonderful sentence. Nearly 70 million people suffer from some form of digestive or disorder, reflux, irritable bowel, constipation, diarrhea, inflammatory bowel, you name it. Science Magazine uh, calls the gut the inner tube of life. If you think about it, it's a tube from the beginning to the end, and it is our largest interface with the outside environment. So everybody thinks allergies, you think, okay, eyes, you get allergic conjunctivitis, nasal allergies, breathing, lungs, but far greater in terms of causing problems in the human body is the gut. Because if you took the surface area of the gut, and I'll show you some of how it spreads out, it would be the size of a football field. That is how much interface our gut has between the outside world. And literally, every time you take a bite of food, it's like ingesting a piece of your external environment and bringing it inside of you. So it's, you know, we think, oh my God, somebody sneezed and I, I breathed it in. Well, what we put in our mouths and what we eat is far more influential in terms of are there toxins, are there bacteria, are there um, 
allergens? Are there heavy metals? Are there contaminants in the foods that we eat? All the in the waters we drink, phthalates from plastic bottles that stay in the hot air. We all man, I used to keep water bottles out in the car and just drink it. You know, a day or two later, hey, that's that's bottled water. I paid for that. You know, but the the chemicals from the plastics leach in. So we're going to spend a lot of time next month talking about detoxification and all these toxins in our environment. Uh, two wonderful quotes, a good set of bowels is worth more to a man than any quantity of brains. And we'll, you'll, you'll understand uh, <laughs> I know, 19th century humor, still funny in the 21st century. That's good humor. So you'll find out they call the gut the second brain, or the, 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 it's actually an enteric nervous system. It's, it's, it's called the little brain in, in the gut. Okay? It's actually a second brain. It develops embryologically from the same area as our central nervous system. And then Sir Francis Bacon in The Advancement of Learning says, a healthy body is a guest chamber for the soul, a sick body is a prison. If you ever go down to Mexico and you get the Aztec two-step, you know what a prison that body can be when you got something working through you. So we're going to talk about the, the, the mind or the brain and its connection to the gut. And Dr. Michael Gershon at Columbia is what, who coined this term, the gut, as the second brain. And what do we mean by that? That a steady stream of messages flows back and forth between the brain and the gut. And if you look at this, the small intestine has as many neurons as the spinal cord. And not only that, but a lot of you know this, 95% of the body's serotonin, you know, the, chemi the neurotransmitter related to depression, is produced in enterochromaffin or nerve cells inside the gut. So you can see there's a tremendous connection between the brain and the gut, or what we call the mind and the gut. So you actually have here the gut uh, playing chess with the brain. They're both uh, intelligent. Remember, intelligent and mischievous, right? Gutsy move for a brain, says the colon. All right, so I'm going to give a little uh, differentiation here between the mind and the brain. You may recognize somebody who co-authored this book down here. I'll take credit with, this is a book that I co-authored co with a, a, a wonderful gastroenterologist that I studied with back at Ohio State, Dr. Salt. And we um, wrote the second edition of this book about 10 years ago. We're, we're thinking about doing the third soon, called Irritable Bowel Syndrome and the Mind-Body-Spirit Connection. And just briefly to, to explain why I just don't use brain-gut connection, the brain and the mind are not the same. Okay, this is a basic principle of mind-body medicine, which is sort of a subspecialty of mind. The brain is part of the visible, tangible world of our physical body, but the mind is part of an invisible, transcendent world of thought, feeling, attitude, belief, and imagination. So although the brain is the physical organ most associated with the mind and consciousness, the mind is not confined to the brain. In fact, in the intelligence of your mind permeates every cell of your body, not just your brain cells. And when you realize how tissue heals at a local level, there's intelligence everywhere. That's that Bernie Siegel saying, I don't know if I told it to you before, but he was a great Yale surgeon who sort of it got involved in the whole mind-body connection and, and worked with exceptional cancer patients. And he would say, as a surgeon, I cut into the body and I rely on it to heal. I don't have to yell into the wound to tell it how. Okay, there's an intelligence in virtually every part of our body. So although consciousness is connected to the brain, m most, you know, most researchers in this area now think it's more like a radio station. It tunes into consciousness, but Consciousness, awareness, intelligence is certainly not confined to the brain. Um, the reason it's important because we look at the mind-body-spirit connection and what it teaches us is that pain in the body can rarely be separated from pain in the mind or pain in the spirit. So when you experience painful recurrent intestinal spasms, for example, from irritable bowel, that affects your mind, and you start to think, wow, am I going to suffer from this forever? I can't stand this anymore. You know, you start to question things. And then naturally that pain flows over into sort of spiritual 
questioning too. You wonder, did I? Am I being punished? Did I? Did, did God? Is God punishing me for this? Did I do something wrong? Uh, what have I done to deserve this? All these things happen in any kind of chronic illness, or even you know uh, the the new onset of illness. We're all going to go through these certain things. So there is a connection between the mind, body, and the spirit. And the definition that this is a definition that I came up with, what is mind-body-spirit medicine? How would you define it? And it's an approach to health and illness that recognizes how the unseen energies of thought, feeling, memory, attitude, belief, and imagination become manifest in the physical body, weaving the very fabric of our physiology and biochemistry. Um, and what I wanted to get across in this definition is that whole concept of Thoughts and feelings are chemical. It, it, you, you can't separate them, and that's why stress is that last tack. And it's probably, if you had to look at those seven hidden uh, causes, the stresses that I cause, I mean, I really think stress is so pervasive in terms of interacting with all these other things that mind, so mind, what is mind, body, spirit medicine? It's really sort of a sub system within the whole functional medicine field. So we all have two brains. Dr. Jack Wood at my alma mater, Ohio State, calls the enteric nervous system the little brain in the gut, and it constant flow of information and messages to the brain in the skull, and then of course the mind that affects the brain as well. So the just like the central nervous system has software programs built in, sort of uh, like uh, the fight or flight response, you know, when, when we're afraid of things, our heart races, our energy increases, our mental acuity um, increases. That is a software program of the central nervous system. The enteric nervous system has its own programs, one of them called, interestingly not, the power propulsion program. Sounds sounds kind of hokey, but it's to move things out. When your gut experiences stress, not even this is a part of intelligence. In other words, a toxin, a bacteria, it moves the gut power propulses from top to bottom to get the peristalsis moving to cause the diarrhea to get rid of that toxin as fast as possible. It's why we just don't go plugging up diarrhea with emodium the very first day. I mean, your body's trying to get rid of the thing, right? You're trying to get rid of the toxin. Now, if it gets to a certain point where it's just so much, you, you then judiciously you use these things, medicines, to slow you down. Oh, sorry, enteric just applies to the the bowel, like the um, like uh, enteric. I guess it's just a Latin word that means intestines, intestinal. So it's a nervous system within the intestines, basically, the enteric nervous system. So here's a, a patient talking to the doctor, and the doctor says, uh, listen, that fire in your belly, which you feel has given you your phenomenal drive, turns out to be nothing but chronic heartburn. So it can work against you too, you know. The guy thought he was onto something. So there is a connection between the mind and the gut. Let's talk a little bit more about this two-way street, the mind and the brain and the gut. Uh, here's the premise, and I introduce it to you at the very beginning of the talk. If nervous thoughts, like preparing for a talk or public speaking for some people, can cause bowel distress and kind of like cramps or the, you know, we all get butterflies and that kind of stuff, could problems in the gut cause a nervous brain, nervous thoughts, right? And that's, that's the gut-brain connection. That's how we're going to talk about one case study, but more and more what we're finding is certain infections in the gut or problems with the gut, allergies, inflammation, create significant brain disorders. It's how Dr. Hyman, in treating a lot of gut disorders, says he became an accidental psychiatrist because he was treating people's gut disorders and suddenly they were getting off antidepressants and getting off bipolar meds. And, you know, it, it, obviously not everybody, but in many, many cases. So that's what we're looking at 
the body-mind effect here. And uh, I like this cartoon. This uh, Professor Herman here, uh, this, patient, this, this student here had uh, definitely a gut feeling that he wasn't going to understand uh, this problem. And uh, Professor Herman stopped when he heard that unmistakable thud. Another brain had imploded. So uh, as a math major, I, I can relate, an ex-math major, I, I can relate to that. So right, gut feelings can implode the brain. Gut problems can implode the brain and cause a, a, a thud. Let me give you this example from Ultra Mind Solution, Dr. Hyman's book, and I can give you many, many others, but two sisters, seven and nine years old, diagnosed with behavioral problems, short attention spans, outbursts and tantrums, right? So what's the first thing traditional old, old paradigm medicine does? Right, we come up with a diagnosis. Oh, diagnosed with ADHD, also diagnosed with bipolar disease, and I'm sure there were many other diagnoses along the way. Treated with stimulants for the ADHD, amphetamine, Ritalin, and antidepressants for the bipolar disease. But when Dr. Hyman got this case, the very thing he does is say, okay, we don't treat conditions. We don't treat diagnoses. I don't care what they told you had. Let's do the testing. If you don't test, you've guessed. Let's do the functional medicine testing. We test the bowels. We test the nutrition. We test the blood. We test the urine. We do all the sophisticated bio biochemical testing that can be done. And sure enough, he came up that both of them had a history of food allergies, yeast infections, and bacterial infections. So in some of the testing he did, he did this urinary polypeptide testing. Now, you can't get these tests at your local lab. There's about three to five very sophisticated functional medicine labs that we use here that some of you have had tests from. Um, Metametrics, Genova Diagnostics, Doctors Data. There's a couple functional medicine labs in the, in the country, and that's it. And so he went to Genova Diagnostics and found high levels of gluteomorphins and caseomorphins. These are protein compounds that are inadequately digested proteins from gluten and dairy. Now, obviously not everybody, some people get gas with dairy, some people do fine with dairy. Not everybody's going to, but, but there are compounds in, in, when the food does not digest properly, these compounds literally have toxic or morphine-like qualities. That's why they call them morphins, caseomorphins. They have a morphine-like nature that basically messes up your brain literally like you're taking drugs. But it's your insides that are creating the toxins or the drug. So you have an inner pharmacy dispensing medicines. It's literally like you know, you, you, we all go through this, God forbid, you know, we have teenagers that go through times when they're ex exposed to, can get, get at risk for getting on drugs and we hope that they don't. And, but you always wonder if they're behaving funny, you know, oh my God, have they gotten into something? Did they get in the wrong crowd? Are they taking drugs? Well, the, the, the bad crowd could be inside of you, you know what I mean, your own gut. So... After treatment with the whole food diet, removal of casein, which is milk proteins, and gluten, which is in the wheat and oats and rye and barley and stuff, and starting digestive enzymes, their mood and behavior normalized, the abnormal peptides disappeared from their urine, and he, you, you can see where this new medicine goes. Now, it's not always that easy an answer. Of course, some people just have behavioral problems, and of course, some people have ADHD and some course. But we want to look for reasons, because even if it's one out of 100, or it's probably more, by the way, but let's say a low of one out of 100, and probably more like 15 to 20% based on the data, these diseases that we call mental illnesses or ADHD in kids, hyperactivity, even autism, these have biological causes that we can now measure and get to. So you see how critical it is. Fix the gut, heal the brain. Fixing imbalances in the gut can lead to a healthier brain, better mood, healthier behavior, greater cognition. Now the converse of that, of course, is that fixing imbalances and stresses in the brain can lead to a better gut. And we'll talk about irritable bowel syndrome in a minute, which is my area of expertise that we wrote the book on. That's a disorder of irritable brain that 
causes irritable gut. So we have to fix some of the stress mechanisms in the brain and learn how to override some of those. It can work both ways, but it, it part and parcel, they're connected. So unfriendly bacteria in the gut and yeast can create brain toxins. Fermentation of starches can produce gas and toxic levels of ammonia. You have these little auto breweries going on. There are even alcohol-like compounds that toxins can form and bacteria, friendly bacteria, and bact abnormal bacteria in the gut. And then also what we learned from that last case study, partially digested food proteins can trigger immune reactions that lead to inflammation in the gut wall, damage to the gut wall, what we call a leaky gut, and then toxins get through. So that inflammation goes from the gut to the brain where it can cause any inflammatory disorder of the brain. Um, it can go to the joints and cause fibromyalgia. It can go to the, to the uh, you, you name it, any system. So here's the guy, uh, the lowly worker talking to the boss, and he says, I understand that life at the top is extremely stressful, but if it makes you feel any better, it's pretty stressful at the bottom as well. I think we can all relate to that. <laughs> uh, stress in the gut. Uh, you see this guy here, stress management is for wimps. You just need a bigger cup of coffee, a little more caffeine to destroy the gut, right? Um, but, but listen, that's what we do, right? We push through it, especially guys are at fault here more than girls, but all of us do it. I mean, we push through, we keep driving it, we go, okay, we'll be okay. And, we, and listen, the truth is, in our 20s and 30s, we can get away with a lot. N none of us in this room can get away with it anymore. Okay, you can't. We have to take care of our bodies. We, we've, we've used up the reserves, right? Chronic stress damages the intestinal barrier. And remember, even stressful thoughts, because thoughts and feelings are chemical, can create inflammatory chemicals and cascades of what we call cytokines that go in the gut and can trigger allergies or susceptibility. Just like stress in a bad dream, you can wake up with your heart pounding and you're sweating. Right? It's very real physiological, biochemical consequences of what you think of as just a thought. But don't, thoughts are, that's why how we think is so important. It's why the ability to think clearly, the ability to believe in something, to have some kind of faith or um, ability to understand why we're here, what we're here, becomes such an important part of healing for so many disorders. That's why we wrote the book and say it's a mind-body-spirit connection. Because the, if you have a lot of existential angst, you're going to have a lot of body angst. If you have a source of comfort or belief, I don't care if it's nature or God or uh, believing in community and working to better uh, the situation for the impoverished, whatever your ism is, it can really help if you connect to it. So also what damages the gut? Antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, aspirin, steroids, the caffeine that this guy's drinking, all disrupt that gut lining. And uh, also gluten is a really big player. Um, now, let me just say a word about gluten because it's the big thing. You would think that every one of us need to be on gluten-free products. You don't. There's a small number of people that are gluten sensitive. Under, you know, probably somewhere, the, the, the figures vary, but you figure some, about 14 out of 100 people have some sort of maybe mild gluten sensitivity. The more serious gluten problems, probably one in 100. But you need tested if you're having problems that could be attributed to it. And if you have it, you've got to avoid it. You know, and the serious forms of gluten intolerance, which we call celiac sprue, you, you can never eat gluten. You can't eat the wheat products and the rye. For the rest of us, they're wonderful, they're healthy, they're full of B vitamins and minerals, and keep eating them. Um, all, same with dairy. And this is that whole biochemical individuality. It's why it's so hard when you pick up a book, you, you see a Dr. Oz show, you see a, and you think, oh my God, I need to do that, I need to do that. I, need. I mean, this is why hopefully you have a good relationship with your doctor. I know you guys do. I don't know about you guys, but, but you, 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 this is what you work through with them. We find out what are your unique susceptibilities and we, and we deal with them. 
So let's look briefly at irritable bowel syndrome because it's such a common thing. It really accounts for 10% of visits to primary care, 40% of visits to gastroenterologists. It is the second leading cause of absenteeism from work, and it causes symptoms without clearly identifiable physical or biochemical abnormalities. I wouldn't say biochemical. I would change that. I would say physical or radiological. Because as we get more into functional medicine testing, we can see some of these imbalances in maybe gut flora that contribute or some nutritional deficiencies that contribute. But basically the problem is you'd go, you'd get a, a colonoscopy, an upper endoscopy, you'd get all the blood tests and come back and say, everything's normal. Right? So as a patient, you think, oh, well, am I just crazy? Am I imagining this? Is it all in my head? And then you realize when you understand the body of the definition of mind, body, spirit, medicine, no, nothing's just in your head. If it's in your head, it's in your body. If it's in your body, it's in your head. The, the, the distinction between all those systems is artificial. Okay, you can't, you can't, uh, so one in every five Americans has at some point symptoms. Irritable bowel symptoms are abdominal pain, cramping, abdominal discomfort that occurs more than, the definition changed a bit in the recent thing, but basically on average about three months out of a year, okay, and it's accompanied by changes in bowel frequency, alternating constipation, diarrhea, or solely constipation or solely diarrhea. So there's subtypes of irritable bowel. Now this doctor is examining the patient and says, I'm afraid your irritable bowel has progressed. You now have furious and vindictive bowel syndrome. I know, it's good. It's good. I'm sorry, say that again. Is it a general category? Oh, no, irritable bowel, you mean the causes of it? Yeah, no, irritable bowel, it's not, it, it is, it, it's the diagnosis, it's the name. There's, a, there's dozens of different potential causes in, in anybody. Yeah, there's no, that's, it kind of goes back to the old paradigm. This is an old paradigm diagnosis, but it's so well known that really now what we do is with functional medicine, we say, okay, this is irritable bowel, but what's going on? What's the cause? Let's look at... Yeah, ir no, yeah, that's okay. I understand your question now. Sorry. Irritable bowel has to be abdominal discomfort or cramping accompanied by a change in the frequency of the stools or the, the form of the stools. So just diarrhea alone isn't a form of irritable bowel. There are func there is a, a syndrome called functional diarrhea, but that's all they get. They don't even get cramping or spasms or pain. The irritable bowel is spasm, pain, discomfort that's relieved with a bowel movement. That's the other key to irritable bowel. You get relief when you have a bowel movement. Um, what causes the symptoms in irritable bowel? Uh, this woman here has an idea. She says, all my stress comes from people not playing the game of life by my rules. So right there, control out the window. And uh, we all like to control what we can, but certainly coming to terms with all those things we can't control is a critical factor in our central nervous system mind-body connection. So we have to get that right. So Emron Mayer at UCLA postulates that irritable bowel is the gut response to stressors, triggers from the central nervous system, in particular the limbic system, or what we call the emotional brain or the emotional motor system. It's kind of one of the more... Um, if you look at the tripartite brain, the three parts of the brain developmentally, you start with the reptilian brain, which is your automatic reflexes, your respirations, your pulse, things you absolutely don't think about and they occur. Then you have, then what developmentally occurred was this limbic system, the emotional brain, the emotional system that you have fear, you have excitement, you have um, emotion, right? So we know that, you know, animals, lots of animals have emotion. But then 
the 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 final thing is the 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 um, the intellectual brain, right? The um, cognitive brain is what's next. So you've got the reptilian, the emotional, and the cognitive brain, and this is really our ability to have self-awareness, to make choices, not just to react emotionally, but our impulses from our cerebral hemispheres can moderate our emotional brain. So that's part of, obviously, that's how we get civilized, right? <laughs> or we end up uh, sociopaths in, you know, some strange cult or prison. But, you know, we all learn to moderate our limbic emotional system. But people with irritable bowel seem to have a heightened sensitivity of the gut to stressors, a heightened sensitivity of the brain. They have certain altered motility problems in the gut. We don't know exactly the mechanisms, but it all has to do with this stress response. Here's the four key abnormalities I could talk. Heightened sensitivity of the gut to stressors. And this is important because, you know, you, th you, you just, unless you have it, it's easy to kind of get a little judgmental about, oh, you know, what are you bothered about? What are you worried about? But, but the same level of stress, if your threshold's here and somebody else gets it down here, you may see something that wouldn't cause a symptom in you, but to this person, they're in full-blown fight or flight, reacting and feeling horrible. So it's really important to understand this is part of our individual differences. Same thing here, heightened sensitivity of the brain to stressors or triggers. We know that irritable bowel patients have, a lot of them have a history of early trauma or abuse. Um, a relatively small percent of the overall number of patients, but that contributes. Early infections is another thing. People have severe gastrointestinal viruses or infections early in life are more prone to, no different than you figure if you sprain an ankle early on or something like that, it may be weak the rest of your life. It, it's a, a weakness. And enhanced visceral nociception, which is increased pain to even minor insults to the gut. Um, so here's the kind of idea of the holier than thou or uh, judgmental attitudes we can get or even about ourselves. You know, we can, well, it's easy to judge ourselves and say, oh, why are you being such a wimp or why are you being so, you know, we can't do that to ourselves. So this guy here says, youngsters these days are spoiled. Apart from the triple bypass, five divorces, four estranged children and cirrhosis, 80-hour work weeks never did me any harm. Right? <laughs> so calming the mind in irritable bowel syndrome, our choices define us. And this goes to that cognitive brain. And these are kind of three principles that I developed. And I actually have another book that I'm working on now called The Healing Power of Attitudes and Beliefs. And these are the basic principles. They're in my irritable bowel book, but I've developed them into one is you have the ability and the responsibility to choose your attitudes and beliefs wisely. Two, what you choose to believe is no less vital to your health and healing than what you choose to eat, drink, or expose your body to. Why? Because thoughts and feelings are chemical, right? Okay, and three, the power of belief lies in the realm of the invisible world of thought and feeling and sometimes imagination. You, we all can imagine that things are worse than they are and experience physical symptoms. But basically, the third premise is that beliefs and expectations are converted by something we call the neuromatrix in the brain into biochemical realities. It's sort of that system in the brain that converts thoughts and feelings into chemicals. We call it the neuromatrix. It's not an actual physical part of the brain, but it involves several structures of the brain that seem to be that intersection between thought and chemistry. So here we've got this uh, worker who's very cool and laid back, right? The, the boss in the big leather chair and the, the worker comes in and he, the boss says, listen, I never let the stress of the job get me down. Because he has two boxes. He has his inbox and his box here says, uh, que sera, sera. Uh, he doesn't have an outbox. He's decided I like that. Chuck, can you change the box on my desk? I need a K sera, sera box. Okay, uh, briefly about other gut problems and then we'll wind down. 
Um, the gut ecosystem, this is a really big thing. You heard of probiotics and healthy yogurts and all those things. The normal flora, over 500 species of bacteria weighing over three pounds are inside of all of us, okay? We have more bacterial DNA in our body than human DNA. I know these things are hard to believe. But the, we, we couldn't live without bacteria. They, they help us digest food. They help make vitamins. They, it's a symbiotic relationship that is developed within us. So the idea that all bacteria are bad is wrong. Many are good, but we're learning to distinguish which are the good, which are the bad. Get the good ones in, get the bad ones out. Um, bad bugs can produce, we already learned this, toxins, ammonia. Um, they can ferment starches into bloating gas and take over the good bugs. And you see here, the good bugs help digest food, produce vitamin K, biotin, control inflammation, detoxify, etc. So some bad bugs produce ammonia and alcohol leading to this little auto-intoxication or what Hyman calls the little microbrewery in the gut. Um, and Walsh studied this in, I forget the year, but 207 patients with severe violent behavior disorders were treated with a functional medicine approach, just what we talked about, On, uh, seeing as there, are there's there imbalance or dysbiosis in the gut, are there problems, are there nutritional deficiencies? And the results were that 76% who followed the program um, and greater than 90, wait, uh, oh, 76% followed the program, stuck to the treatment regimen, and 90% of those significantly reduced severe behavior problems. Um, that's a lot. That's a lot. You know, time will tell if the, these data poll, you know, um, pan out, but the point is it, it makes us take a whole new approach to, you know, mental disorders and uh, social um, misfits and, you know, all kinds of behaviors that we're, we're quick to judge as, listen, uh, you know, I have to say we probably all grew up and you'd see certain kids and you'd, you'd say, oh, my God, what did those parents do to that kid? You know, and then you grew up and had kids of your own and you say, oh, my God, what did that kid do to those parents? You know, so... It's not as easy as, as but, but it, it makes us take a new look at things. It's not always parental. We know so many families where, you know, two kids are great and the third one's just off the wall, out of control. Um, I'm going to go through this real quickly, but basically the idea, remember, leaky gut, the, 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 the key here is that these cells of the, of the intestinal wall are simply one cell layer. It is that thin. It's one cell between the outside world and you. And underneath these cells lay, and we didn't talk about this, but something we call GALT, the gut-associated lymphoid tissue. The, you think of lymph glands here and lymph glands under your arms and your groin. The lymph tissue in the gut is, I think, 90% of all lymph tissue is inside your intestines. That's why it's the primary place that that infections are dealt with and immune reactions happen and allergies occur. Those, the, the lymph is here. So when these junctions between the cells get damaged from toxins or caffeine or stress, then abnormal particles get through, it causes food intolerance, antibodies attached to those in partially digested protein like we learned about the caseomorphins and the gluteomorphins and then those then lead to everything from autoimmune disorders to brain inflammation to behavioral disorders, etc. Wow. Uh, oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, it's, it's uh, listen, it's, uh, the gut is what? Intelligent and mischievous. Just to give you an idea why the surface area goes to the size of a football field, <clears throat> you look here, there's these little crypts in the intestinal wall. These, this is that one thin layer of cells. 
but there's literally thousands of these and on top of each of these there's what we call microvilli there's a whole nother subsystem of crypts and folds and so all the foo particles can go through here but you see once they penetrate that single cell and get in here there you go there's a vein there's an artery and right under here is uh, here's the lymph tissue there's the you can see the lymph gland the yellow goes all the way up into that villus and uh, and so that's the only protection I mean look I, you think of the gut it's a border it's border patrol you think of the problems we have just in this country with border patrol a physical border you can imagine and the guts main job is to let the good stuff in the nutrients and the good healing um, nutritional things that your body needs the vitamins and the minerals and keep the bad stuff out and there's a lot of activity goes on here it does it does it have you mean does it have motion probably yeah yeah I mean there's muscular cells right under here so there's yeah, it's not like the villi inside the lungs that that move particles up. It doesn't. But the, yeah, if you look at the electron micrographs, they they wave around a little bit. Uh, this is a much more detailed examination of that process and how it's all presented to the immune system, etc. But so, how long does it take to heal the gut? Well, when you remove the causes. Uh, i.e. the bad stress, eliminate the food allergens, get digestive enzymes if necessary, put in healing nutrients like glutamine and zinc and probiotics, you can really heal the gut very quickly within a six-week period. You can get a lot of The gut turns over so quickly. It's one of the fastest regenerating organs that there is. And we know that. I mean, every cell in your gut is completely different every six weeks. All the old, other, the, cell, the living cells that were there have died and new ones were made to take their place. It's like living in a house that's being constantly remodeled to the point that you don't even, you can live in it and you don't even know, but that, that's our whole body. I mean, it's, the problem is it uses the same blueprint. So if there's a damaged room, it creates the same damage. So, you know, how to change the blueprint, that's where stem cells come in and a lot of, you know, the new therapies that we're looking at. So this unfortunate soul went into the boss's office to give her some good advice because she was stressed out. And he said, all I said to her was you ought to remove the cause of your stress. Well, apparently uh, he's more involved in that reaction than we thought. Okay, let's talk briefly about this and then we'll wind it down. I mentioned this in the beginning, the dangers of acid-blocking drugs. 10% um, of Americans have heartburn every day. Acid-blocking drugs are the third top-selling drugs after Lipitor and Plavix. So Lipitor for cholesterol, Plavix for clot formation and blood thinning platelet agents so that we don't get strokes, etc. Shutting down acid does stop heart heartburn, but it has some ill effects as well. Why? Because stomach acid is necessary to digest protein in food. And the irony is that most of us think of it as acid indigestion, like, oh, we all have too much acid. Well, the fact is just the opposite. As we age, and we've known this from studies in the 30s, most of us by the age of 40 to 50 have about half the stomach acid that we did in our 20s. So we're already not digesting proteins and foods as well. I have a patient who I just diagnosed, we did some of the functional medicine testing on, she's just so tired lately, we did this what's called NutriVal, a urine and a blood test, she's not absorbing any of her nutrients. She's eating an unbelievably great diet. I said to her, Cindy, I can't believe it, this is a great diet. So why do I feel so bad, I eat so good? Well, we'd have never known if we didn't test, but we looked at her amino acid profile, virtually none of her amino acids we're getting in. Why? Because that acid in the stomach, it decreases by 50. She's in her early 80s. By the time you get there, a lot less acid. If acid doesn't start the digestive process, these proteins don't get broken down into amino acids. And you can eat the best protein, the best meats, the best vegetables, fruits in the world. It's not going to get in your body and do any good. She was malnourished. 
So what do we do? I put her on digestive enzymes with a little betaine hydrochloride, a little hydrochloric acid to stimulate her stomach to start digesting these foods. And that's the treatment. But, you know, without testing, we'd never know. We'd assume, oh, that's a great diet. Can't be your diet. Let's look at, you know, maybe it's stress. I mean, that's what most are. Oh, you're probably stressed. But I'm not stressed, you know. So those are the things that go on. The other really big thing that acid does, and really important, probably as important as digesting protein, it sterilizes. It keeps bacteria from getting through the stomach. Bacteria should not live in an acid environment in the stomach. This is how, and this is some of the reason that these drugs can be so dangerous. It lets, if you ingest food that's contaminated or has a little, you know, salmonella on or whatever, these things, if you have a good acid in your stomach, it's going to get burnt out in the acid reaction of the stomach. If you don't, that infection gets through to the intestine and boom, next thing you know, you got diarrhea, you got the full-blown gastroenteritis from salmonella, shigella, dysentery, you name it. So these things, they do treat, and this is old paradigm, right? We're treating the symptom. We are not treating the cause. The far better way for most people, now there are some people who just have such bad reflux where the acid goes back into the esophagus that these medicines are necessary because if ulcers start to form, you got to do it. It's a trade-off. But every one of those people should be on digestive enzymes. If you're taking these drugs on a regular basis, you should at a minimum be replacing the acid and you take one or two capsules with every time you eat. And that puts the acid back in the stomach so you can digest the food. Um, and then it helps you absorb calcium, magnesium, vitamin B12, because one of the things that parietal cells make in the stomach is intrinsic factor, and intrinsic factor is a, is a, 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 a chemical that your body needs to absorb B12. And as we know, B12 causes a lot of problems as, as, you know, if it's deficient. It can cause dementia, it can cause weakness, fatigue. Remember that homocysteine to SAMe? That's a B12 reaction. It's why a lot of you come here and get B12 shots. And, you know, for years, doctors would, insurance companies would say, oh, B12, that's a, it's a placebo, you know, it doesn't do anything. But people would routinely feel better. Hey, doc, can you give me a B12 shot today? Feel great. Well, it turns out it, it, it does make you feel great because it, it gets absorbed right into the bloodstream. So it doesn't rely on the gut because you don't have enough acid to make intrinsic factor to absorb the B12. So here's a nice way to bypass it. You get a B12 shot. And some people don't absorb B12. Obviously, uh, you know, pernicious anemia is the classic disease where the body makes antibodies against intrinsic factor and you can't absorb B12. So you have to get shots. Or sometimes you can take it sublingually right into the bloodstream. But so you see, when we treat symptoms, this is like when we treated the blood sugar in that ACCORD study. Remember, it's not always as simple as it seems. The guy with the arrow in head, I better do some tests. Um, because if the tests aren't done and you don't, you know, find out if there's enough acid in there, you're going to end up malnourished and uh, infected. And, and if you're not absorbing the nutrients, I think I have a slide here somewhere. You're, you're, oh, yeah, you are not what you eat. You are what you absorb. So my patient, Cindy, is a perfect example. When the gut's damaged and inflamed from toxins or allergies, um, or when it's filled with the wrong bacteria, which prevents absorption from the good bacteria, or enzymes are damaged by mercury or heavy metals or acid-blocking drugs, the essential nutrients for a healthy mind and body just don't get in. So you start to see the little nervous system, the little brain in our gut, and the big brain very connected, right? A lot of this, this is an interesting guy. This Roger Williams who discovered vitamin B5 or pantothenic acid. This is Roger Williams. Anybody know who that is? What? Linus Pauling. Yeah, Linus Pauling, vitamin C guy, right? These guys were geniuses. I remember reading a book by Roger Williams when I was a teenager. I was like 14. I don't know how I got it. And he was talking about biochemical individuality. And... He must have been in his 70s then. He died in 1970 or 80 or something. And this book spoke, and I remember reading this, and I was like, that's unbelievable. He goes, there will be a day when we're not talking about, oh, this vitamin's good for you. You're going to go in. They're going to take a blood test. They're going to 
check on you, and they're going to produce the perfect vitamin nutrient just for you. Biochemical individuality. And he didn't live to see the day, but he knew it was coming. These guys were brilliant. They, they, they worked through very complex problems when nothing was known. And uh, you can still buy his book on Amazon, Biochemical Individuality. That wasn't the book I read. The, I forget the name of the one I read, but he spoke about it in there. Um, and he says, look, there's no such thing as an average person. We're all genetically and biologically unique. So how do you fix your gut? Just a quick review. Clear out the bad bugs. Eliminate food allergens. We do have blood tests where we can check. Do you have food allergies? To, to dairy, to milk, to gluten, to all these things. If you do, you've got to stay off those foods for about two to three months, and then you can reintroduce them slowly. And then you, So you take out the bad stuff. You eliminate allergens. You support digestion with enzymes and acid. You add in probiotics and healthy bacteria. Add in fiber, which is actually what they call a prebiotic. Fiber helps. Fiber is fuel for probiotics. The good bacteria live off. Uh, the metabolism of fiber. That's their food. So by eating lots of soluble fiber, you out actually help keep your healthy bacteria healthy. Add in healing nutrients. And I like what Dr. Hyman, how he talks about calming the mind. He says, find the pause button for your brain. Right? It's, it's kind of a nice way to think about it. Uh, some of the healing nutrients, glutamine, bioflavonoids, quercetin, saccharomyces is a, is a probiotic. Any of you who get the, the orthobiotic that we have here as our probiotic, it, it's one of the few that actually includes saccharomyces in it. So it's, it's really state of the art. Um, here's a simple way, the four R's to remember. Remove the offending agents, stress, allergens, bacteria, replace missing or weakened enzymes with digestive enzymes, acid, fiber, re-inoculate with probiotics and repair the lining with healing nutrients. Doesn't take that long, six weeks. So, you know, when, you're, when you suffer from, from any kind of chronic illness or a mind-brain gut disorder, I use this approach in the book and talked about Rachel Naomi Remen, who's sort of a, a mind-body physician, and she says, look, Illness has become a form of Western meditation. And it's an interesting thought. Until we get sick, we don't really pay much attention to these things, right? Certainly in our 20s, we don't. I mean, unless you're really exceptional and focused and, you know, we, we just get away with whatever we can. But as time goes on, instead of waiting to get sick, you know, and use the sickness as a form of, okay, but when we do get ill, instead of beating ourselves up or um, feeling that we're, you know, we did something wrong, with it, use it as a, a chance to think and contemplate, understand the deeper issues that underlie our daily life. You know, I work through this with a lot of you. I won't mention any names, Chuck, but... <laughs> And Chuck's getting back at me now. He's saying, now you got to slow down. But, but, you know, Chuck's a healthy guy now, and he wasn't two and a half years ago. He had to make some change. He was getting sick, and he completely reversed a whole bunch of very serious things by changing his work schedule, actually retiring at that point, do, you know, focusing on what's important, and he took it to heart and did it. Now, unfortunately, I've created a monster. He's getting on... It's getting on my case. And then we'll end with this. Getting your gut isn't always easy. You see uh, the boss here, and this guy had a brilliant idea, and the boss says, look, it would appear, Hopkins, that your gut feeling was only indigestion. And uh, so that's the end of our formal presentation. Any questions or? Yes, Alice. Yeah, vinegar is great. Apple cider vinegar or any of those things are a great natural way to restore acid. Uh, I don't know what it is. You have to look at the dose. A teaspoon before you eat. Wonderful. Great idea. Yeah. Yeah, the longer we're on them, listen, these problems don't show up for months, years, decades sometimes. Right, Gert. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, I mean, listen, doctors are incredibly fallible. If they don't work with you, if they don't listen to you, if they don't learn from you, and, uh, you know, I've learned, I learn almost everything from listening to my patients. You read, you read the books, you read the stories, but, you know, I, you, you, a lot of people have really intuitive about their body, especially the women. The guys, not so much. They're kind of like, I don't know, I don't know, you know. They and they really don't. But the women, very intuitive about their bodies, and any doctor who doesn't listen or poo poos it and says, you know, uh, oh, you have it anyway. I don't like that. It doesn't usually work. That's the old school patriarchal. I'm the teacher, you're the student, I know everything, you know nothing. Boy, unfortunately it doesn't work, you know, it doesn't work. It maybe worked in the day of, you know, appendicitis and, you know, when we didn't have much to treat, you know. I mean, listen, we didn't have much to treat 50 years ago. How long ago were antibiotics discovered? I, mean, I forget the year, but penicillin in the 30s or, you know, prior to that it was pretty much, the old uh, Rock, Norman Rockwell, you know, the patient, the doctor, it was his coming to the bedside and holding the hand and reassuring that made all, it was the, the central nervous system. It was the, the relationship that made all the difference. We'll talk a lot about the placebo effect during the stress module. And that's just a fascinating, when you really understand the new definition of placebo, you know, we treat placebo like, oh, the drug's only as good as placebo. It, it's not it's not a good drug. You say, well, what about the placebo? Thirty percent of people got better from the the thought that they would get better. Well, you now know why because thoughts are chemical, right? But when we we actually have some great studies that we can uh, uh, put in narcotic antagonists like Narcan, and it will block the placebo effect to reduce pain. So we actually are finding some of the mechanisms that the thoughts translate into pain relief or healing. And, you know, so it's fascinating what's going on. But any other questions? Thank you very much. I appreciate your attention. And uh, thank you. And I appreciate your laughing at the bad jokes. Mostly, I'm a frustrated stand-up comic, you know, so... Oh yeah, she she's she's taught me a, a quite a few. Oh, and by the way, please, just to uh, if you, my daughter and her friend Maddie had I had to pick them up to school and they had to come here because my wife couldn't pick her up and they made a, a sign. So if you didn't see the welcome sign when you came in, please. Oh, with the pointer, please look it over. We're so happy you're here. This this is healing, right? Kids are healing. I mean, so thank you. Thank <laughs> you.